things to add. You know, a pig value is rolling in the mud. Right? And we can't say, well, the pig has a greater and lesser value of existence because that. So her first point is our values are tethered. Right? It makes no sense. Um, we value what is human for us. No life has an absolute value. I think that's a fairly knockdown argument. She's not, she's not a crazy, not that would be a bad thing, she's not a crazy animal activist that wants to give less value to human life. What she wants to do is tether value to human life, the only value she has otherwise will leave. Um, so to make this clear, she has the example that it makes no sense for me to say, oh, I wish I had been Napoleon. Because if I had been Napoleon, I wouldn't be me. It doesn't make sense. You can't say, I wish I were a cat, because if you were a cat, no, it, 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 she wants to make this stark um, unsubs it, the non-substitutability of our lives. So I think this notion of value being tethered to a life for whom values make sense goes beyond the way we value animal lives and has something um, essentially cinematic about it. But first I want to go back to those white settlers who came into Australia and looked at those lives and saw them as lives not worth living. Right? I think that makes perfect sense. For me, to be without books and an iPad right, and a comfy jacket is what life not worth living because that's because it's me and that's the way I've been composed. Um, it makes no sense to think of that as value as such. Um, and why do I want to argue that this is cinematic? Because, well, my, my other claim is that, which I won't go into here, but that most Western literature and culture from about the 18th century onwards has been cinematic in this sense. Read 99.9 .9 recurring percent of novels, it places you in a character's point of view, you take on their world and their values, and then that is the character that must survive. Right? So what, what Western narratives, probably from the 18th century onwards, but particularly cinema, is what must survive is what occupies the point of view of value. So there can be interesting plays on this. I think there was the TV series Dexter, which traced the, like, a, a very, you know, you wanted Dexter not to get caught and get, you know, so the, um, what I'm arguing is there's something cinematic about that. To take on a point of view such that all value is tethered to that point of view. And that that's how post-apocalyptic cinema works. We can see most of the globe fall into chaos, death, and destruction, but the character for whom we're viewing that is saved, and therefore the world is saved. Right? So that's what I'm saying about tethered value. And in case it's not obvious, I think this has very serious geopolitical and racial implications, right? So that um, the, the point of view of the, of the narrative is the one that has value, right? And what must be vanquished is what threatens that point of view. Um, so while it's true that narrative, especially in its modern and novelistic form, relies on a point of view and therefore allows the unfolding of tragedy or happiness to be tethered to the life and lives we are following, cinema has a way of intensifying this possibility. Think of the way, in particular, the world that must be saved and that cannot be swept away is essentially the cinematic world. Sometimes it is um, obvious in films like um, Galaxy, where it's the internet that's going to be destroyed. Um, but very often, it, there's a central controller, usually in Washington, D.C., but usually in some um, space, it's central command that manages what bit of the world can be saved. The explicit theme of New York or DC as the control room into which images of misguided leaders and stuff and people appear is surrounded by implicit themes in which the loss of the media is the loss of the world. And that includes the loss of books being the loss of the world. Right? We can't imagine. We think that a world in which we don't do this is not a world. We think of people that don't do this as not human. You know, this is reading, not praying. <laughs> Reading, not praying. Um, we think of that as a form like cl uh, close reading, reading, um, as what defines us. But 
But if you think about it, 99% of humans who have ever lived never did this. Right? It's a very, it's a unique blip in, uh, in human history. So one of the many ways in which this has been depicted is in the possibility of zombification, which is, of course, the extreme loss of world relation to political being. Um, zombies are mere life. Now, there's, of course, a whole racial politics to zombies that's not insignificant. But what I want to draw attention to is the fact that just existing and not having a sense of the world is regarded as the end of the world, and it's certainly not human. Now, the extreme case um, of this sort of horror of losing the world um, occurs in a milieu in which disaster edits rely on the viewer, as I said, watching massive global destruction only to arrive at the heroic saving of the world. So here's where I start to talk about one specific film, which is I Am Legend of 2007, which, um, if you haven't seen it, should make sense anyway. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's a remake of a remake, right? So there's the man at the end of the world, um, Omega Man. So Manhattan seems to hold the world only survive. It seems to hunt, uh, which is played by Will Smith. Um, he subsists on leftover food, so the only way he survives is through the vestiges of industrialization, canned food, um, raised people's fridges, and the last vestiges of cinema and TV. He keeps going to a DVD store. Um, before streaming, I guess, right? But goes through, and he's going through the DVD archive. Two crucial scenes raise the question of what it means to die in order to save the world. So this is getting to the crux of it. Will Smith's dog, the lone survivor's dog, is bitten. And he thinks he can, he takes him home. And we have, as a result of the film, a very affective attachment to this dog. And he sees the first signs of zombification start to appear. He looks at the dog's eyeball and then has to kill it because it's becoming one of them, not one of us. We see the threshold between the life we save. He does everything to save this dog's life. But as soon as the dog becomes other, he has to kill it. In the case of humans, so the threshold in this, in this dog is uh, it loses its fur, its eyeballs take on a certain motion, and it kills it before it becomes other. Saves it from becoming other. That's what he sees in, in dogs. In humans, the threshold in this film is cognition and sociality versus zombification. You could be one of them or one of us. This might sound. It's unquestioned that you want to save us, not them, the zombies. You've just got to kill them to save your world. Right? It's obvious. But I want to raise, why is it obvious, right? That from the point of view, it's because Will Smith is like us and they're like them. Um, what's really at stake is saving one's own kind. One's own kind. So in the second scene that I want to talk about in the film before I draw this section to a close, um, the central character played by Will Smith finally just finds a cure for zombification. But as he does so, the zombies are coming at him through a glass screen. So he hands the zombie cure to the one other survivor who's going to take it to New Hampshire, and then he commits an act of world-saving suicide. But it's still a happy ending, right? Because even though he dies, and he's killed with zombies, he's saving humanity, which is in New Hampshire. The glass screen is the division between us and them. So what I Am Legend renders acute, but I think it's in every post-apocalyptic film, is the sense in which a certain type of humanity is defined through certain qualities, Western, urban, affluent. So on the one hand, it's a certain type of humanity, um, but must destroy those without world, and we're prepared to see the rest of the world in I Am Legend disappear as long as a pocket of New Hampshire is saved. So it's at once political, but it's also purely existential. It must be we who survive, not them. We who view, and not those who simply exist. So Post-apocalyptic films look sort of um, myopically racist. You know, it's always the West 
and the rest of them. They are myopically racist, that's, but that's not interesting. They're also um, profoundly metaphysically racist. That is, racism is there to be an us, not them um, exercise. So here's the last section, um, which is about the allegory of extinction versus the allegory of extinction versus the irony of extinction. So this is my um, last film, which I think is one of the most profound. Um, it's not a post-apocalyptic film, but I think it predicts the fall. 